So <clears throat> as is well known, all present day Germanic verb second languages make use of expletive elements um, as an apparent last resort to fill the clause initial position in root clauses. So some examples are given in the first slide in one. So typical contexts are ex existentials, presentational sentences and impersonal passives. They all seem to have in common that they uh, lack a potential prefinite topic either because of a special information structure or simply because there is no um, uh, spec CP filler available in the clause. All right. So, and um, <clears throat> again, as is well known, pure uh, CP explicit expletives are confined to clause initial positions. So if the clause initial, the prefinite position is occupied by another element, they cannot show up in a postfinite position. This is shown in 2B. And basically, of course, the same holds for embedded clauses. So CP expletives cannot occur in the TP domain. And uh, of course, no such restriction holds for other non-referential proforms such as quasi arguments, uh, for example, with uh, weather verbs as in 3A uh, and cataphoric pronouns uh, relating to an extra post clause as in 3B. Um, in this talk, we will take a closer look at the historical development of CP expletives um, in German, focusing on, well, S, the third person, singular neuter pronoun. All right. Um, yeah, while there's quite some amount of work on the historical development of subject expletives, comparatively less is known about the rise of CP expletives in the Germanic web second languages, with the possible exception of Icelandic, um, which is extensively discussed in Hannah Booth's work. In, in generative approaches, it is generally assumed that the rise of CP expletives is a side effect of the development of an EPP feature in C, leading to generalized verb second. And concerning the potential source of CP um, expletives, it has been proposed um, that the expletive use of S developed by a reanalysis of other non-referential non uh, uses of this pronoun. For example, in a classic paper from 1917, Karl Bruckmann argued um, <clears throat> that the CP expletive developed from the cataphoric pronoun as in a way um, yeah, um, schematically shown in four. And basically the very same analysis has been proposed in recent work by Hannah Booth for Icelandic. However, however upon closer inspection, um, it becomes clear that this cannot be the whole story. Um, first of all, it appears that at least in German, there seems to be a chronological gap of about 150 years between the development of um, generalized verb second and the rise or the first appearances of this expletive use of S. In other words, while generalized verb second was already very much in place in late old high German, that is around the 11th century, um, the uh, expletive use of S is usually characterized as a mid or late Middle High German development, which took place in the 13th and 14th century. <clears throat> okay, um, perhaps this problem can be solved if we assume that prior to the emergence of expletive S, German had developed another CP expletive. And as in, has been pointed out in the literature, one <clears throat> potential candidate is do then originally a deictic temporal adverbial. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, um, some brief remarks on do. Apart of or apart from its original function as an adverbial, uh, do was also used as a discourse linker in Old High German. So when placed in close initial position, um, it Function, functions as a temporal anaphor that picks up a time interval that, that has been previously established in the discourse, very similar um, to Old English tha. So, um, however, it appears that do could also serve an additional and different function, which is showcased in five with uh, three examples translating the very same passage from uh, the biblical Christmas story. So in 5a and 5 B, we can see 
that Do is used to introduce a new foregrounded situation in which a new temporal interval is established, typically at the beginning of a text or a text section. In early Old High German, this particular function is usually accompanied by verb first order as shown in 5a. So Do appears in a post-finite position and the, the clause begins with a finite verb. However, with the uh, consolidation of verb second order, Do could also assume this function when placed in um, post-finite and pre-finite position as shown in 5b. And crucially, as can be seen from 5c, this is basically the same function expressed late, later on by the CP expletive s. And this um, lends further, further support to the idea that Do was actually the old high German precursor of S as a filler of the specifier of CP. Um, but then of course, uh, a second problem um, pops up, namely, um, if we um, assume that Do acted as a CP expletive, we might ask why um, <clears throat> Do was later, later on replaced by the new kid on the block, namely the CP expletive S. And this is at the center of today's talk actually. So um, we will address the why question in section four. And right now we will take a closer look at the early stages of this development in middle high German, focusing on the time course of this change and the context that favor the expletive use of S. All right, <clears throat> in what follows, I will present some results of a corpus study carried out in the middle high German reference corpus. Uh, we extracted all cases where uh, S directly precedes the, precedes the verb, the finite verb, and is in turn directly preceded by a sentence boundary. The search produced 1,769 hits which were uh, manually narrowed down to 440 in four cases uh, where S is used as a CP expletive. And um, <clears throat> if we take a look at the time course of this development, we can see that um, the bulk of relevant examples is from the 13th and 14th century, basically in line with the standard view in the literature. However, we can see that there are also a couple of examples from um, or early examples from the 12th century. All right. And um, here you can see one of these early examples dating from the first half of the 12th century, a passive clause with a postverbal subject where the initial position is occupied by S, clearly an instance of an expletive use. All right, next, I would like to take a closer look at the at a selection of linguistic and extra linguistic factors that seem to favor the use of S as a CP expletive focusing on type of subject and genre or text type. Okay, first of all, it appears that expletive S frequently combines with indefinite subjects. Well, actually this is not surprising given the no topical subject condition, which we um, mentioned earlier. So, and this is actually the case in, well, two thirds of all examples. Um, the effect is particularly clear uh, in connection with the indefinite pronoun alles, all. And there are, in, there are 38 cases in our data set where um, the expletive S combines with um, alles, which is used as an indefinite subject. And in these cases, of course, alles stays in a lower position. And in the whole corpus, there are only two examples where um, this um, indefinite pronoun occupies the specifier of CP. So it, it seems that it's, so to say, um, this is a typical uh, example given here in seven on this slide. All right. Um, next, let's take a look at a, an, an extra linguistic factor, namely genre. So um, it uh, appears that Roughly 40% of all instances of expletive S appear in legal texts, that is statute books, codes of law, et cetera. And uh, this is kind of surprising because these legal texts constitute only a minor portion of the overall corpus. And it appears that this um, expletive use of S is 
especially frequent in certain legal statements, that is requirements, prohibitions, and commandments. And one such example is given in eight on this slide. <clears throat> um, and the, and, uh, but what I, will, what I would like to show next is that the influence of text type or genre becomes particularly clear if we calculate the frequency of expletive S uh, relative to text size, that is token numbers. And this is shown in the next slide. So the graph here uh, gives you the normalized frequencies of expletive S in the text we considered. Note that we considered only text that uh, included or contained at least five um, instances of expletive S. So it appears that expletive S is most frequent in the five texts at the bottom highlighted by the green box. And crucially, all of these are legal texts. In contrast, it seems that expletive S um, is quite rare in narrative texts. And I will, I will come back to that. Okay, well, this basically sums up what I've already said. Um, <clears throat> there's one additional observation which, which I haven't mentioned yet, namely that roughly one half of the early texts showing expletive uses of S are adaptations from Old French or Franco-Provençal. Up to now, we haven't been able to take a closer look at this, but of course it might be taken to hint at some form of language contact taking place here. All right. Um, Finally, let's take a look at the distribution of expletive S in comparison with its precursor, that is clause initial DO. Uh, here we can see that distribution, that the distribution of DO seems to be um, the mirror image basically uh, of the distribution of expletive S. In other words, DO seems to thrive in narrative texts, that is so to say the upper two thirds of this graph, while it is close to absent in legal texts. All right. So um, <clears throat> this slide lists some preliminary conclusions before uh, Roland takes over. We have seen that the tra traditional view that uh, the expletive S emerged in the 13th and 14th century is basically correct. We have also seen that there are a couple of earlier cases dating back to the 12th century. Um, <clears throat> in addition, uh, it has become clear that the expletive use of S is particularly frequent in legal te texts, while it is rare in a narrative text, and well, Do uh, seems to exhibit the mirror image of this di distribution. That is, uh, Do is frequently used in narrative text, but rare in legal texts. In texts, right? So, and the distribution of Do and expletive S seems to be in line with an analysis that treats Do as some form of discourse discourse continuative marker while expletive S is used in clauses that are temporarily independent and introduce a new tense setting or a new situation. Okay, so now it's Roland's turn. Thanks, Eric. Um, I will uh, just begin the slide. Yeah, okay, here we are. So, <clears throat> So now from the discussion, from what Eric told us, the, the picture of the historic data, we see that the, the rise of Vorfeld is, of course was helped by the generalization of Vituro, but cannot only be due to this factor. We have to say that uh, is replaced though uh, in particular, in one particular function. Uh, um, <clears throat> and we need an explanation why is appears in those contexts exactly where uh, and replace though where it first appeared namely in legal text, but not in narrative text. The proposal that we're gonna to make a uh, make uh, uh, given in one and two. Um, <clears throat> so S replaces though in its uh, dictic use referring back to the utterance situation. Uh, this means that though is replaced by contentful elements. So this is the new part of the story. We don't say it's an expedit anymore. Uh, which allows us also to get rid of DPP feature and align uh, the occurrence of ACE in the C domain with novel accounts on V2, where it is believed that it's a complex condition combined of uh, some condition of work movement, followed by a bottleneck effect that has only one and only one XP mo being moved from the uh, I domain to the C domain, but not necessarily to the same head that the, that the work is going into. 
So the proposal uh, that we're going to make is that S is a demonstrative pronoun with a weak definite reading. This is going to be crucial. That has a function, a discourse function. We need to anchor the predicate to the context. So, to, um, so basically, we want to say even <clears throat> the forefield is, is not an expletive. It contributes to the interpretation of the utterance. Basically, the difference being between a sentence like 9a <clears throat> is that 9a is a categorical statement about an individual. It characterizes an individual, while 9b uh, is indicates that we have a fetic statement about a situation. <clears throat> now, when we <clears throat> say about, when we think about anchoring, then normally a predicate is anchored via tense and moved uh, to the utterance situation. So this is uh, indicated in ten. John visited his mother, so he meant. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, <clears throat> a representation of this in event semantics would be something like there's a visiting event and this event is in the past, meaning it uh, occurs before the utterance time. Now, this simple linking approach runs into problems when you look at discourse or narrative text sequences of events. John visited his mother, she was sick. So if you simply link back by past tense, the second event, <laughs> To the utterance time, <clears throat> they could uh, E1 could precede or follow or overlap with E2 as long as both precede the speaking time. But of course, we understand that she was sick at the time of his visit. So we need uh, something like a reference situation. So in standard theory, tense is treated as a predicate on times or intervals, and we propose a situation based account of tense. The tense is a predicate that relates situations, and then the temporal interpretation is secondary. Um, a precedence uh, relation between situations is interpreted that the running time of situation one precedes the running time of situation two. This will become important when we talk about subject expertise. Uh, <clears throat> um, we need to distinguish weak and strong definites. We introduce them. In the nominal domain, the distinction is known in, <clears throat> from various uh, discussions. We have a different, there's a, on the pragmatic side, there was uh, the discussion brought up by Donnellan about the attributive and the uh, uh, referential use of a definite determiner. So the standard case is one is given uh, in 14. So the background for 14a is uh, um, a refers to a per person in the, in the room um, it's, uh, at the end of in the other corner, he particularly sees it is pointing to him. That person is drinking a glass of mineral water. And a says the man drinking champagne over there is insane. The point is the reference can succeed even uh, if the description fails, which is completely different in the attributive use one. Uh, Here's the case, a person was killed in a terrible way. The inspector comes on the crime scene and utters 14b to refer to an individual that it, uh, whose identity is completely unknown to him. Um, in general, we had, it has been noted there seem to be two different usage conditions on the definite uh, article in Germanic. Uh, one is in situations out of the blue where it's just, so the sun is shining today uh, where um, the, the sun can be uniquely identifiable, or the so-called so familiarity approach, the reference that uh, the definite uh, it, uh, description is referring to must be introduced in the previous uh, uh, in a previous situation, a previous discourse, and there can be other men, and there's no uniqueness uh, effect. <clears throat> The distinction, however, is not only one of usage that uh, how Donella thought about it, and it is known that various Germanic dialects have twofold paradigms. In standard German, the distinction becomes uh, visible only in certain uh, determinant preposition uh, combinations like Hans being in's house, Hans being in das house. But there's also a syntactic effect, maybe a strong definite expression. Uh, like in 18, uh, Hans, er hat seine Freundin sofort umarmt, is uh, normally distressed, undergoes scrambling in the front of adverbs and picks up a discourse reference. So here you identify his friend, uh, his girlfriend with Maria, while <clears throat> the, the weak use basically remains, uh, leaves the EMP in situ uh, where it receives stress and where it introduces a new discourse reference. 
So here we learn in the meeting situation, there's another person involved. <clears throat> The proposal that we're gonna make is basically we argue for a unified approach. We say the uniqueness condition is important uh, in both uses. Uh, when you have um, a weak, definitely it's part of the assertion. You say there's a unique individual that has the relevant property in the situation, while in the strong use, uh, the uniqueness condition applies to the antecedent situation. So what is underlined in 21 is thought to be a presupposition. Okay, um, now why is this important? Uh, mm -hmm. This distinction comes to play now we talked about weak and strong definite description of individuals. What we am saying, proposing is that there are also weak and strong definite description of situations. And this is, particularly clear when you look at correlate S, when you have correlate S with uh, predicates like being a shame, which is an individual level predicate, here is, is obligatory. Um, but if the clause is topicalized, uh, S has to disappear. So if it's given information and uh, if it's given in the discourse and it picked up, S is replaced by another demonstrative element, thus. And of course, what we're going to suggest is ACE is the weak version and thus is the strong version or of, a, of a pronoun that uh, characterizes a situation, not an individual. Um, the same holds true for object clauses, even it has been pointed out that ACE is different, ACE is, is generally optional, but it, it has the same properties. So uh, if the object clause is topicalized, ACE has to disappear. And if it's given in the context, then uh, you better use the strong version, thus. Um, <clears throat> and basically, we're going to say this optionality follows from another property. Namely, these verbs can take pair CP complements or uh, complements that where you have an extended, you extend the CP with a DP. So the analysis, uh, there were. Uh, different analysis in the past. I think the last proposal was by Sudhoff, who says that ACE is a determiner. Here, of course, um, it basically would work very well because it takes uh, a proposition, which is a predicate on situation, a property of situation, and uh, the determiner analysis is correct. But since ACE and DAS can occur alone, we assume that <clears throat> ACE and DAS uh, a demonstrative pronoun that bind the situation argument but that, that has not fully grammaticalized, but what we see in the nominal domain was already there basically in the demonstrative. So um, the, this weak and strong reading is not a result of grammaticalization, but it's only that isn't, um, that the, the, the definite determinant in a nominal domain cannot be used intransitively as a demonstrative pronoun. And here's what I said, uh, we can generalize this also to subject clauses, but only the conditions are different. Uh, but basically um, it's an approach of economy as I will show in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so now what, what we're gonna do with weather verbs, so the so-called subject expedite. If we get rid of the EPP feature and restore the original principle behind it, namely that every predicate needs a contentful subject it can be predicated of, we have to say that uh, raining has to, in 25 has to be predicated of something. And the proposal is that it is predicated of the situation argument of tense, namely its reference situation. So it says the reference situation is an element of the situation in which it rains. Um, in 26, I give you, if you treat um, is as a generalized quantifier, you can see that you get uh, the, um, the perfect uh, derivation of it in tense first combines with the VP meaning and then is applies to that. Uh, property of situations. <clears throat> um, of, um, now, existential construction, Eric pointed out uh, that we find uh, a lot of is in existential constructions and presentational constructions. They are, of course, these verbs do have an argument, but the argument is indefinite and cannot uh, <clears throat> anchor the predicate in the context. Uh, so an anchoring expression must always be a definite description of either an event or a situation, uh, of either an individual, sorry, or a situation. 
Um, um, <clears throat> so putting all, everything together, we have two types of A's. Uh, one is inserted in spec TP, and that, that is in alternation with a null discourse anaphoric pronoun. And the other one is inserted in the spec position in the delay of an extended uh, CP, and that is in alternation with discourse anaphoric thus, as we have seen. Now, what is Vorfeld is, is now, <clears throat> Uh, is nothing else that an S uh, inserted in spec TP as a means of last resort in case also in spec TP of a sentential comp, uh, argument and uh, the conditions I will uh, give you in a minute, just if no other element is topicalized. Uh, I have given, um, <clears throat> this follows from a prosodic condition on V2, but the particulars are not important. This is just when you have a V2 rule in German um, that um, respects the bottleneck effect, but um, you want to exclude, so you can only move one element from the IP domain to the C domain, but if you have base generated elements, then this condition will give you uh, additional verb movement um, if you have a, a base generated constituent or so, you can exclude uh, both V3 and V1 orders. These are the two clauses here. Now, um, let's now look at, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's go back to Vorfeld is uh, here with a, with a predicate, uh, where, with a correlate. Um, we have noted that uh, is, is optional. <clears throat> yeah, so we can have the CP complement can be a bare CP or a, an uh, extended CP as a DP. And this is true even if it's for, if it provides new information. Of course, yeah, I should have mentioned that makes clear that is appears when uh, the CP complement is new information. When it's given information, then it's moved into subject position or topicalized, and then is disappears because it introduces a new situation. It's not compatible. Uh, we see as long as we have another filler. Uh, in the Vorfeld, um, ACE is excluded, so it means that you assume for economy reasons just the bare CP. Um, now, how is ACE replaced um, by DO? Uh, we want to say that basically DO, <clears throat> basically DO became, um, I mean, it probably always was uh, ambiguous between a weak and a strong reading. But uh, in, old, in, in old high German, the, the meanings were differentiated because you could have a V1 order, V2 order. When V1 order disappears, Do uh, can only uh, appearing in the first position, in initial position is ambiguous between continuing a given discourse situation or introducing a new discourse situation. And um, in, uh, an additional impugnable level, uh, and additionally, um, though fell together for independent reasons with uh, the locative da, so it became multiply ambiguous, and was replaced by s because s has just this one reading and another effect, probably an effect or something. But it's clear in modern German when you have da. It only is. It only allows for a discourse anaphoric reading. Um, so, uh, so you, it's raining in Iceland, but not in the utterance situation. Yeah. Uh, so it has lost its uh, its weak reading completely, and that's why it's clear that uh, um, it needed some replacement. How are we doing with time? Am I going over time? Um. um I can stop in one minute. So uh, this is yes, basically almost uh, five minutes, including discussion. Okay, so go ahead. Um, well, maybe I should stop. Um, I think uh, every, everything was clear. This is the summary um, uh, of our claims. Um, and uh, yeah, the major claims are of case A is not semantically vacuous. And we can explain the historical development why A has replaced Do. Um, only in, in a story by giving is a discourse function and uh, meaning in the sentence. Um, I apologize for being running over, having run over time. Um, I'm taking your questions now. <laughs> <laughs>